Well, thank you, Michael. It's great to have you here um, and to hear you reflect on Ramsey, which I have served in, uh, and also to think about the future. And it's the future and its implications that I think are, are really interesting. For those that are unfamiliar with Michael and I, uh, just a little background. I met Michael when he was at the Office of National Assessments. As I came in, he was pretty well walking out. Uh, I didn't take it personally, but uh, Michael was working on transnational issues, and predictably, I was working on Pacific Island issues. I went off to Ramsey, Michael went off to the ANU. I went back to the ANU. Michael was doing Asia Pacific. I was doing Pacific Islands again. Uh, you went off to Melbourne and did International, and I came to Lowy and did Pacific Islands. So um, I'm thrilled that Michael's decided to just spend the last five years of his life researching a book on Solomon Islands and realize that the center of the Indo-Pacific is actually the Pacific Islands. Uh, but I think it's interesting, Michael, just to unpack a little bit how someone who is involved in international relations, India, Southeast Asia, and a little bit, to be fair, on the Pacific Islands, what is it that made you think that this is something you wanted to do, that it was important? We forget a lot of things in history, mm -hmm. so you know Solomon's isn't isn't unique that way. So what what drove you to want to write this book and invest that time? So uh, thanks, Meg, um, and uh, I I was reflecting on our long history as well. <laughs> um, look, most of my career I've been fascinated in Australia Asia relations and mm. um, have have done a lot of thinking about it. Um, but there was always this element in the back of my mind about Australia in the Pacific because. What really does intrigue me about Australia and the Pacific is that the Pacific is the only part of the world in which Australia is a great power. And in fact, there's an old joke that Australia is too powerful for the Pacific and not powerful enough for Asia. And I think that's been the central tension at the, at the heart of Australian foreign policy for a long time. And I think when I first visited Solomon Islands in 2015, I, I sort of was fascinated by the country, but I thought, that the case study of Ramsey was a classic, um, you know, a classic kind of microcosm of Australia as a great power trying to achieve something in the Pacific, but facing all of the problems of great powers whenever they try and exercise power. And what really fascinated me and kept me going on the book was, if you like, the micropolitics of power that played out on the ground in Solomon mm. Islands, particularly that difficult period in 2006, 2007, when we faced the government of Manasseh Selgavare, who decided that his way to success was going to be to play the post-colonial card against Australia and basically boot Australia out of Ramsey and out of the Pacific and out of Solomon Islands. And uh, just watching the micropolitics of how that power plays out was utterly fascinating to me as a, as a political scientist. Well, kind of the micro, but I think today, as we have announcements of AUKUS and nuclear submarines and our alliance in the region, that middle power, great power, however you want to define Australia, comes into play. And I think you said in your book, interventions and alliances can never escape politics. Mm. And we are facing politics as we move forward with AUKUS. You have a region that is very wary of anything to do with nuclear yep. anything. Uh, it doesn't want to be militarized. Yep. Uh, we have AUKUS that we're trying to, in a sense, push into the Pacific and convince them this is something they want to be part of. Are there lessons from Ramsey and the way we did our interventions then and the way it transformed perhaps over time that might inform us as I think the Prime Minister is about to go to Fiji to talk to the Pacific Island Forum, talk about AUKUS, talk about our role in this region. Well, I, I guess, you know, the, the thing that um, became very apparent to me in Solomon Islands and probably a lot of the rest of the Pacific is that politics is very personalised mm -hmm. and very deinstitutionalized. If, if If you go to a country like Australia or Indonesia or Singapore or, or whatever, politics is mediated through powerful bureaucratic institutions. And as you know well, bureaucratic institutions in the Pacific are very weak if, 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 you know, if, 
if not non-existent. And so politics is played by personalities and quite often big personalities and it's always personal and it's always for keeps. And so one of the ways that I think Sogavare himself is watching Australia and watching China is how does he use these two external forces to manipulate the very personal politics of Solomon Islands in his favour? Um, how does he keep Australia close but far enough away and at his beck and call? The best way of doing that is to cultivate a very intimate relationship with China. Mm. And if we go with that, geopolitical is intense right now mm. in the region. And I think what sent a shockwave through the allies was when Solomon Islands last year, which Michael mentioned, and I think you mentioned in your, your remarks, uh, came up with a security pact with China that would include police capacity mm. building and indeed embed some Chinese uh, trainers within the force itself. Uh, and that was after Ramsey, after more than a decade of police capacity building and close interaction with Australia, New Zealand and the rest of the region. So I'm interested how you see that. Was it a failure of Ramsey? We didn't, he didn't create a strong enough police force. Has it something to do with the nature of policing in the Pacific or perhaps something else, because you mentioned Sagavari said uh, that it was a way to stand up to Australia. But Sagavari has also said it was filling a gap in the Pacific and he needed to diversify. So how do you see that piece of history, given all your study of Ramsey and all that went into police capacity building? Well, I mean, you could, you could actually um, bring it back to um, the politics of Ramsey. Sogavare was always an advocate of a powerful armed police force. He was first Prime Minister in 2000 after the coup, uh, where he, um, he significantly ramped up the arming of the police force. Quite often criminal elements from particularly the Malaitan forces went into the police force. He created Star Division, which had high-powered rifles and became part of the criminality that was in Solomon Islands at the time. He became Prime Minister again in 2006, 2007, and once again, he wanted to arm Solomon Islands police. And Ramsey, headed by Australia, said no. They were listening to the people of Solomon Islands. The people of Solomon Islands who had been traumatised by armed police, armed criminal police, um, they said, we don't want our police armed. And so um, Ramsey said no to Sogavare, and Sogavare actually tried to stitch up a deal with Taiwan at the time mm. to provide armed, you know, armed training to Solomon Islands police. So he felt frustrated by, by Ramsey and, and Ramsey dragging its heels on arming Solomon Islands police. So with the, with the benefit of hindsight, this is Sogavare scratching a historical itch, mm. but it's the best way to get under Australian skins mm. as well. Mm. I mean, this is Australia's worst nightmare. Mm. He knows that very well and he's manipulating that all the way to the bank. That's true, and that is a part of Prime Minister Sagavari. But to be fair also, there was continually this view about, and still is in the Pacific, wanting to be heard, wanting mm. to have genuine partnerships. Yep. Uh, and that was a bit of a problem, and you raise it in your book early on uh, with the Ramsey intervention. They came in, Australia was clearly in control. They always took the position of the special coordinator that was coordinating it. And, and initially you have, it was sort of Australia having a take it or leave it approach. Uh, this is the way we're going to proceed. Uh, and it is a whole package. Yep. You can't cherry pick and say you want the policing, but not the governance uh, or the policing, but uh, not economic development or whatever. So you had that to begin with. Mm. I think it's fair that it got more adaptable, had a better partnership near the end. But where do we come into this role of the tensions and this whole problem which you raise about colonialism and not wanting to be a colonial partner, but on the other hand, paying, I think, you know, 80% or more and wanting to shape the yeah. nature of this. Yeah, it, it became a, a very complex challenge for Australia to negotiate. Mm. You know, the fact that um, once 
Howard and Downer had taken, made the mental leap of, yes, we are going to intervene. Yes, we are going to do a, a, a state building intervention. It then became, it's our way or the highway. Mm. And, um, and there were repeated attempts by everyone from Kamikaze onwards to say, why don't you help us with land reform? Mm. Can you do a little bit more on rural development? And there was very much um, a fear in Canberra of the mission getting dragged into areas that they didn't want to go into. Mm. There was a very clear kind of understanding that um, Ramsey had to steer clear of politics, mm. that it would get it, it, it would fall apart if it got caught up in the politics of Solomon Island. So there was this very kind of rigid mindset that, no, no, we came in to do these jobs and we're going to do those jobs and and no more and we'll leave once those jobs are done. Mm. And that became a very complex undertaking for Ramsey to try and negotiate its way through. I'd like to get some more of insights that you gain because the unique thing about this book is you got access to government cables, correspondence, meeting notes, things that none of us right now have access to to write this. And it must have given you an insight into the way Australians were thinking about it, which may not have been in the public domain, uh, the real drivers of why we went in and why we stayed for so long. It may not have had a deadline, but the idea was never it was going to be mm. more than a decade. So I'm interested, as you plow through those cables and all that work, what are the new insights you got? What were the, the understandings of why Australia did what it did, why it resisted sometimes, why it felt it had to give? Mm. So I should reassure the audience that um, I got access to all of those materials with permission of the yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, sneaking I, I at have, night. <laughs> I don't have microfilm kind of stashed away. No, I was, I was very grateful. Peter Varghese, as Secretary of DFAT, gave me access to the DFAT files and cables, which uh, I was able to go through. Look, there, it, it, it's very hard to keep that, that, the answer to that question short. Mm. I think one of the interesting tensions that came out of the, the documents and cables, ministerial letters, and all of the interviews that I did was this sort of tension between Australia wanting to construct an Australia-like state in Solomon Islands, this kind of maximalist kind of thing that, that we haven't done our job properly unless the Solomon Islands Ministry of Finance looks like a mini version of the Australian Treasury with all of the same systems and all of the same processes going on versus the, what you would call the pragmatists who were saying, we're never going to construct an Australia-like state um, it's always going to be some version of the Australian state. And then there was that tension of saying, how much of do it going partway along the road to constructing the Australian state is enough to say that we've actually achieved something here? And what was really interesting post-2013 as Ramsey was contemplating drawing down was that the number of times that I would go to Solomon Islands and talk to Ramsey officials and quite a few people were using the example of scaffolding, that Ramsey was like a scaffolding around a crumbling building. And so it had constructed the scaffolding and it had allowed some reconstruction to go ahead, but no one really knew when they started taking the scaffolding off whether the building would start to crumble again. And that was the art of trying to work out when Ramsey, it, when it was appropriate for Ramsey to um, uh, to, to kind of withdraw. And I think the, the real kind of sharp intake of breath occurred uh, about a year after, a year and a bit after Ramsey had withdrawn when riots broke out in Honiara again mm -hmm. and Australian troops had to go back in. And I think there were a number of people in Canberra who thought we took the scaffolding off too quickly. And I think that's an ongoing question in, mm. in a lot of minds. Did we do enough? Okay. And quite interestingly, when you talk to Solomon Islanders, they also wonder whether Ramsey pulled out too quickly and whether Solomon Islands made enough of Ramsey's presence over those 14 years. And how long do you stay is always the question before you have to go. I, I think this whole thing of Ramsey going in, it was a whole of region uh, effort, as you <clears throat> talked about. And I think 
absolutely it built regional solidarity. And now we leverage that up. We talk about a family first approach to security yep. in the region, uh, meaning that we look to the Pacific Island Forum members first. Obviously, that's not China, but that's also not United States. Uh, it's not Japan either in mm -hmm. terms of the Pacific Island Forum. So this is actually quite an interesting concept. I wanted to talk to you about this, this family first. Is this the right approach. It has the advantage of the interoperability, leveraging off of what we did achieve um, with Ramsey. But is it, as you talked about uh, in your remarks, but also in the book, is it just this security motif coming around again of strategic denial or a South Pacific Monroe doctrine, doctrine you, you refer to? So I'm just interested in your reflections as we really push hard on this family first narrative. So the, the reality that, that's occurred is that the Pacific itself has changed. Mm. For a long time, Australia was able to assume a leadership role in the region and really foist its own agendas onto the Pacific region. So, um, you know, after the Hawke-Keating reforms, we tried to push a kind of neoliberal agenda onto the region. Then 9-11 occurred and we tried to push a kind of transnational security agenda onto the region. And then climate change became an issue and we didn't want to go down that track so quickly, and we tried to drag them towards our climate change agenda. Over time, the Pacific got wise to this, and it realised that, that particularly around the climate change agenda, the Pacific has a global stage mm. to act on. And somewhere in the midst of Ramsey, the Pacific said to Australia, we are no longer going to dance to your tune. Climate change is our tune, and we're, we're sort of in a situation now where we're trying to kind of convince the Pacific that there is a kind of geopolitics play going on and the Pacific is having none of it. The Pacific, in, in fact, is saying, bring it on, bring the, bring the geopolitical competition on. Mm -hmm. Never have so many countries been so interested in the Pacific. Never have we been, have we been given so much access to markets, to technology, to investment, bring it on. We like the geopolitical competition. This is a completely new and completely complex game for Australia, and we've got to up our game here. Bring it on, but they're, they're asking for more control over the security Absolutely. agenda. Yeah. So we are now doing bilateral security agreements, Vanuatu, Kiribati, and we're currently negotiating one with Papua New Guinea, which is going to be a security treaty, so one up. And so it is about those countries starting to say what's on the agenda when we talk about security, as well as being part of the Pacific family. But I thought it was interesting when Prime Minister Marafa of Papua New Guinea uh, talked to Albanese, our Prime Minister, and said, you know what, we want a security treaty, but we want it broader. And if there's one thing that we need to be secure, it's economic sovereignty. So he's just dragged in trade and investment to unusually a security treaty. Mm. And it goes back to Ramsey, where we went in and said, there's three pillars. There's an economic pillar, a law and order pillar, and a governance pillar. And we have to balance these out. We had a lot of trouble in Ramsey keeping that balance working. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have a bit of trouble with a security treaty that starts to leach into investment, economics, climate change, and more traditional security, reflective of the Boy Declaration, but nonetheless, if you're, you're going to try and do this, it's quite complex. So, you know, when you look at Ramsey and that balancing act, the three pillars, and now you look at the way security is being discussed regionally, the Boy Declaration on regional security, it's many different forms of security, and the bilateral security agreements that are a little beyond what normally one thinks of. Where do you see this is going to go? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I mean, I think people like James Marape are watching the Solomon Islands very closely. Of course they do. Hey, of course. And uh, I would think in his quieter moments, he would think it's a masterstroke on behalf mm. of Sogavare because it's given him leverage. Mm. If I was negotiating the Australian security agreement with Papua New Guinea, I would be very worried. What does it mean in relation to Bougainville? Mm. What happens if conflict breaks out in Bougainville? What does the security treaty commit Australia to doing in that, in that situation? Mm. 
Um, and of course, as you know, um, the long history of, of the Australian relationship with post-independent independence Papua New Guinea, mm. do we provide them with budget support? Do we provide them with pro project aid? And what are the conditions of, of that? Um, I think it sounds like Australia is signing a very big uh, open cheque to mm. Papua New Guinea and it's absolutely in Papua New Guinea's interest to keep this going. Yep, doing a good job at the moment. So, Michael, before we go to questions, I wanted, you've written a really thorough history of Ramsey with sources that we all hope to get access to one day, but maybe not <laughs> just for a little while yet. There's an old saying, and it kept just reiterating in your book, that if we don't know our history, you're doomed to repeat it. Right. So I just thought in wrapping up, you know, your reflections on have we learned the lessons, the lessons that there are on Ramsey, and in future engagements, alliances, interventions, would we do something different? So I've thought a lot about this and I, I really can't see, and I'd be happy if people would put me right on this, I can't see a, a, a reflective process that's occurred within DFAT mm. about what happened in Ramsey, what did we learn? Um, you know, it was partly the reason I, I wanted to do such a thorough job in the book because, um, you know, the, the, the files themselves are not in a terribly good condition. I don't think they're mm. particularly complete. I don't see the process of a thorough kind of post um, withdrawal, withdrawal review that's happened mm. and the, the, the lessons learned. I think the um, absorption of AusAid by DFAT back in 2014 is a huge mistake. It's lost us an enormous amount of expertise on the Pacific but also on development. And I don't see DFAT as having inherited that expertise. So no, I don't think we've we've less, le learned the lessons of Ramsey. Um, and I would encourage DFAT and other institutions of government to, to start a process of self-reflection of, of what's actually happened and to listen to Solomon Island, Islanders. Some of the best interviews I did for the book were Solomon Islanders who ha had some really profound reflections on the politics of Ramsey and what had worked and what hadn't. Yeah. Well, I think it's time to do collective reflection uh, with, with the audience and, and open it up for the questions that are burning in your mind on this topic of Ramsey, what have we learned? And also where, where are we, we going? So I'm happy to, to throw it open to, to people uh, in the audience for any questions. If you would just identify yourself and your affiliation, I think that would be helpful for Michael when he's, he's doing his responses. So do we have any questions uh, right here? And then we'll go this way. Yes, please. Congratulations. Hi, Jaime. Um, when I visited uh, Ramsey in 2006, one of the civilian experts there, I think it was Sue Ingram, who's now at the ANU, said the problem with trying to rebuild a state is that you're starting, you, you don't have a nation yet to build it on. And I just wonder if the Solomon Islands is any more a nation now than it was then with people up north in Sogavari's own province looking at Bougainville and maybe feeling more uh, familiar with them and the uh, people on Malaita, the deposed premier running his own foreign policy with Taiwan and uh, talking of a referendum on separation. So that that's a great point that Sue makes. Um, I, I would go further and I would say that there was no nation in Solomon Islands and there was no state. So the British, um, very much like Australia and Papua New Guinea, um, uh, ruled Solomon Islands between 1893 and 1978 um, on a very minimalist, they didn't want to invest anything and they didn't invest anything. And the people of Solomon Islands were basically taxed by the British colonial authorities that provided a, a minimum amount of, um, you know, public order, and that was about it. Very little public health, almost no education. Um, and then when uh, it was obvious that decolonisation was happening in the Pacific, they adopted a measure of self-government, but it was a, a, a pretty poor amount. And so basically Solomon Islands was, um, was gifted a Westminster system 
with no history or heritage of understanding how that system, quite a complex and I would say socially embedded system worked. So the politics were um, dis dysfunctional from the start and there was little um, help in building the institutions of government. Uh, there was no, there was never any um, provision of public law and order, particularly in rural Solomon Islands where most Solomon Islanders live across thousands of islands. Um, and so there was no state and the state that did exist uh, was hollowed out and gutted by um, a, a series of venal prime ministers and, uh, and you know, the, the, the kind of uh, economic interests that, uh, that came in to, to uh, exploit uh, Solomon Islands um, forests as well. Um, claims for uh, separatism were there at the time of the founding of Solomon Islands. So I think it was three of the provinces never even attended Independence Day celebrations and never acknowledged the creation of Solomon Islands. So this was never a, a, a polity to start with. And I think it's one of the challenges we face in the Pacific that the, that the state is an alien form that has been grafted onto these societies and hasn't particularly taken root very well. Um, and as I talk about in the book, the, the, the state is another form of, ex, of resource extraction that is used by provincial politicians uh, to claim resources and to build their power bases back within their electorates. And that was a process that was accelerated during Ramsey. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult situation. Sogavari himself is a proud nationalist. He would love to create a Solomon Islands nation and talks a lot about the nation of Solomon Islands. He really believes it. The problem is that the people of Solomon Islands are increasingly divorced from the political class. You know, the contempt that you hear from ordinary Solomon Islanders for their elected politicians, who they see as venal, as corrupt, and the China factor actually increases the distance between the, the elected politicians and uh, the people of Solomon Islands. People of Solomon Islands tend to be highly suspicious of China. Um, they are opposed to the large, uh, relatively large Chinese migration to Solomon Islands that they see as having sort of stitched up the small scale economy there at the expense of ordinary Solomon Islanders. And they are also very attentive to China's kind of crackdowns on the Christian church in China itself. So this is a complex politics and it's, it, I think it militates against the creation of a, of a viable nation and a viable polity there. We we'll go next to Mihai. Hi, Michael. My name is Mihai. I work with Meg in the Pacific Islands program here at Lowy. You would have seen Canberra under a lot of pressure over the last year or so with respect to Solomon Islands. Um, Prime Minister Sogavari achieved what arguably previous prime ministers before him have wanted as well, which is to put Australia off balance, um, to deliver an asymmetric um, kind of diplomacy. How can Australia regain its balance in its relationship with Solomon Islands? So it's something I've thought a lot about. Um, it's a very, very complex game. Um, what I would urge the Australian government to do would be not to compete directly with China. I think there's been too much, uh, the Chinese are doing X, so we'll do Y to kind of directly counter that. I think Australia needs to be a little bit more confident about its position in Solomon Islands and Pacific more generally. Um, one of the legacies of, La of Ramsey, as I said, was um, the building of a, an extraordinary relationship of trust and warmth with the people of Solomon Islands. Um, and we, should, we shouldn't be competing to build you know, stadiums and roads and things like that. We should be investing heavily in law and order, um, law and order services, health uh, and education, which is what the people of Solomon Islands really want and what the government of Solomon Islands is not delivering for its own people. That is um, the big vulnerability that, that Sogavari and the political class have, is uh, the fact that they are not popular with the people of Solomon Islands 
Um, and it's, it's the vulnerability that was there all the way through the Ramsey op operation, and it's the vulnerability that still exists. Um, so we need to be clever. We need to work with his government, obviously, as well. But we need to realise that we've got an enormous asset in um, the, the people of Solomon Islands also. Um, but this is, this is going to be a long game. China is here to stay. So we'll go right to the back and then I'll come forward. <laughs> um, hi, Michael. Uh, my name is Mary. Um, I work actually in the private sector uh, with a satellite company, but focused on the APAC region. And um, I actually would be interested to know what, um, just with the changing geopolitics in the region, we saw um, Telstra, uh, Telstra acquire Digicel um, to combat I guess, China's acquisition. Um, so I guess, what are your thoughts on the role of the private sector in partnering with government to tackle some of these challenges? You mentioned um, addressing, I guess, tech and health and education. Um, I think there's a lot of, I guess, a broader skill base available in the private sector. And I guess, how would you see that? Or is that something that could happen with DFAT or defence or whichever relevant area. Yeah, look, I, I, I think there is a significant role uh, to be played by the private sector. Um, one of the things that Ramsey didn't do was to broaden the Solomon Islands economy away from, let's face it, basic resource extraction. Uh, so there are basically three commodities uh, that Solomon Islands economy is, is based on. Uh, logging is one, very unsustainable. Uh, minerals is another and fishing is the third. Um, Ramsey went in with great hopes uh, that a liberalising, that liberalising the economy, um, selling off uh, pro uh, public sector assets would bring a, a much broader economy, broader economic base. And it really didn't happen. Um, when Ramsey left, uh, the base was about as, as narrow as it always was. I, I still think that Australian and other kind of international um, uh, investors have got a role to play in helping broaden the economy. And that would have a major effect on uh, the society of Solomon Islands as well. I mean, Solomon Islands has a very young population and a very, very high youth unemployment rate. It's one of the factors that makes the place so volatile. So I do think that there's a major role uh, for the private sector to play, particularly around the tech sectors in the Pacific. And I think we had a question just in the middle over here. Uh, thank you very much. You, you mentioned health, education, law and order just a moment ago and you added climate before that. They would all fall into the definition of human security, I might suggest. Is one of the failures of Australia's response is a lack of appreciation or commitment to human security as opposed to traditional security, does that, might that help explain the forgetting? And might it also explain some of the difficulties we are having in the region at the moment? Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's, it's unarguable that Australia's uh, recent um, uh, motivations in the Pacific have been very much attuned f to traditional security uh, reasons. Uh, we, we're there uh, in such a big way because we want to counter China. And let's face it, so is New Zealand, so is the United States, so is Japan, um, so is the UK and others. Um, I think, you know, we could benefit from some refocusing. Um, again, I go back to um, the need for us to think, to rethink um, not having an independent um, aid agency, uh, development assistance agency, to recreating that expertise in the Australian government, which I think has been fundamentally lost. Um, I think a rebalancing in, in the way that Australia sort of approaches the Pacific, uh, rediscovering some, some of those older human security impulses that we had, you know, through the 1990s in the Pacific uh, would be very much to Australia's benefit, both on the human security and the traditional security sides. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, maybe at the back there. Um, I've got Matt Brown, I'm the News Standards Editor at the ABC. 
You mentioned that um, Howard and Downer decided on the intervention against departmental advice. So where were they getting advice from to do it? Where did that, uh, where did that come from? Look, I, again, I think it was very much uh, their reading of the politics of the moment. And I would really put it down to uh, their, their sense of Australia as uh, a major strategic actor. Remember, this was the period of, you know, the deputy sheriff. It was the great state building moment. It was the belief, particularly that neoconservative belief that the George W. Bush administration had that the West was all powerful, uh, that democracy and capitalism were, you know, the, the, the natural order of things, and that with a little bit of a push and shove, developing states could be shown the way uh, towards stability and order and, and the Western way of the world. Um, I was just saying uh, to Michael and, and others and Meg and others before we came down that Howard actually made the decision to go against departmental advice on in May of 2003, that weekend, when he and Jeanette were invited to Crawford, to the Crawford Ranch of George W. Bush, as the reward for having participated in the invasion of Iraq. And it was on the plane flight back that Howard read the memorandum from PMNC that said, we don't recommend an intervention, we recommend more of the same arm's length aid and advice. He, Howard sort of resolved to call Downer as soon as the plane landed, which he did. And it was during that phone call that Howard and Downer decided that Australia would, would lead an intervention into Solomon Islands. So it was, it was one of the most remarkable eras of, uh, you know, a prime minister and a foreign minister deciding that the moment was right to go against, you know, what had, what had basically been 20 years of Australian foreign policy orthodoxy and do something completely different. That's great. And I think we've come full circle to mm. interventions and alliances never can avoid the politics Absolutely. of the situation and the personalities. So I'd like to thank Michael on behalf of Loey, Michael Fully Love and myself for coming, launching your book here for a very stimulating conversation. I believe the book is being sold outside somewhere. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for urging us to keep reflecting, analyzing, and thinking about the future and what it means. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.